Direct and Indirect Reduction Techniques We differentiate between direct and indirect reduction techniques. With the direct technique, the fracture is exposed. The reduction instruments remain visible when inserted into or near the fracture zone, and the result of the reduction can be examined visually. With the indirect reduction technique, the fracture is not exposed and the reduction is usually achieved by longitudinal traction, sometimes using reduction instruments inserted through the skin. The result of the reduction is then checked by X-ray, arthroscopy, or computer. The choice of technique depends on the location and fragmentation of the fracture and the degree of damage to the soft tissues. Technique with two-pointed reduction forceps. The main fragments are each held with one reduction forceps. Use of two reduction forceps allows reduction in all six degrees of freedom of the fragment dislocation, extension contraction, ad lattice displacement in two perpendicular planes, ad axum angulation in two planes, and rotation around the longitudinal shaft axis. Thanks to the pointed reduction forceps, the devascularization of the cortex is only punctiform and therefore insignificant. Technique with one-pointed reduction forceps. With a simple oblique shaft fracture, the proximal and the distal main fragments can each be grasped by one jaw of the reduction forceps. Tilting the forceps results in the desired extension and the reduction of the ad lattice dislocation. Technique with one retractor. The tip of the 8 millimeter retractor is moved along one of the main fragments towards the fracture and inserted into the fracture site. The retractor is then turned 180 degrees so that its tip is inserted into the medullary cavity. The desired extension and subsequent reduction are then achieved by tilting the retractor. Technique Plate With a screw, the plate is loosely fixed to the main fragment, which forms an obtuse angle with the plate. The other main fragment is reduced approximately by traction. By tightening the screw, the correct reduction of the fragments is achieved. This technique, described by Weber, is now widely used, especially for the reduction and fixation of the fibula in the presence of a type B malleolar fracture. Anti-gliding plate for a type B malleolar fracture. The one-third tubular plate is applied dorsally. The fracture is reduced by tightening the first screw in the proximal main fragment. Technique with eccentric screws. If a fracture gap should remain after the approximate reduction of a simple shaft fracture, it can be reduced by means of eccentrically inserted screws. This technique only allows manipulation coaxial to the longitudinal axis of the plate or the bone. The maximum reduction distance is limited to 4 millimeters. In cases where larger reductions are necessary, we recommend using either a tension device or the pull technique with the bone-holding forceps. Push and pull technique. For the fine adjustment of a simple fracture, the fragments are often distracted and then compressed. This can be achieved with the tension device or the bone spreader and the bone-holding forceps. The tension device is fixed to the end of the plate with a monocortical screw, and the hook is hinged onto the end of the plate. The fracture is distracted by spreading the tension device. After turning the device and inserting the hook in the last plate hole, contraction or compression can be achieved at the level of the fracture.
The same can be accomplished with the bone spreader and the bone holding forceps. Technique using a provisional circlage wire. With a very unstable fracture configuration, it is useful to obtain a provisional hold using the circlage wire technique. While the wire is being passed round and tightened, reduction is maintained by a reduction forceps or an assistant. As with all the techniques shown so far, this may result in some devitalization from soft tissue stripping. Multifragmental fracture of the distal femur. Reduction and fixation with a submuscular condylar plate. First, the blade seat is prepared for the planned condylar plate. The main difficulty here is to achieve the correct flexion-extension alignment of the short distal main fragment. A joystick K-wire inserted percutaneously in the sagittal plane can be of help, since the distal fragment can first be brought into full extension relative to the tibial plateau. If retractors are inserted as far as the medial side of the comminution zone, the surgeon may obtain a better overall view of the site but this will critically disturb and destroy the remaining vascularity of the comminuted fragments. A second 2.5 mm K wire has been inserted into the distal main fragment to serve as a joystick. The condylar plate is inserted from the distal direction under the layers of the vastus lateralis muscle with the blade facing in the lateral direction. When the plate is positioned as far proximal as necessary, it is carefully rotated 180 degrees in order to insert the blade into the bone. The shaft fragment must usually be dislocated slightly in the lateral direction. The plate-holding instrument is mounted onto the plate. The problem lies in the correct insertion of the blade into the prepared canal since the condylar plate stands away from the femoral shaft, which creates a divergence between the blade and the bone canal. The bring the piano to the chair technique is now applied. The distal main fragment is aligned with the blade by abducting the lower leg. A joystick can also be used. The blade of the condylar plate is then pressed into the bone manually. The correct axial alignment of the femur and the partial reduction of the fragments within the comminution zone are then achieved by distraction, soft tissue taxes. Traction is created either manually with the femur distractor or using a fracture table. The comminuted fragments must not be exposed. It's neither necessary nor wise to finely reduce the fragments with a dental hook. The fracture has been correctly reduced in both the frontal and sagittal planes. The vascularity of the comminuted fragments has only been marginally damaged by the surgical procedure. A rapid bridging of the comminution zone with callus can be expected. Fracture of the distal radius. Reduction according to Kapandi. A K-wire is inserted under image intensifier control into the fracture site on the dorsal side of the radius. The fracture is reduced by simultaneously drilling and tilting the wire in the distal direction. The final fixation is achieved by perforating the far cortex with the same wire. Fracture of the distal radius, joystick reduction and fixation with a radial-radial external fixator. A 2.5 mm threaded K-wire is inserted into the tuberculum listeri in the sagittal plane, and a second K-wire is inserted into the styloid process of the radius in the frontal plane. The wires serve as joysticks for the reduction of the fracture in both main planes. The flexion extension alignment and the correct radio ulnar alignment of the fracture are easily attainable. 
After reduction, these two K wires are combined with two additional threaded K wires inserted into the proximal main fragment to form a radial radial external fixator. Split fracture of the lateral tibial plateau. The reduction can be performed under open or arthroscopic reduction control. Fracture reduction with the large pelvic reduction forceps with pointed ball tips. The tips of the forceps are inserted through small stab incisions. Final reduction in the presence of a medullary nail. In the event of a persisting malalignment following medullary nailing of a fracture of the lower leg, final reduction can be accomplished before insertion of the locking bolts by means of a pointed reduction forceps inserted through the skin. The reduction can also be forced by using a missa nail screw. By inserting a missa nail screw, the bone and the screw are both more or less pushed away from the nail, which is tightly anchored in the proximal main fragment. Reduction techniques for the pelvis. Reduction in the presence of a rupture of the symphysis. In the presence of a rupture of the symphysis with a malalignment of the external rotation of one hemipelvis, reduction can be achieved with a pointed reduction forceps. The tips of the forceps are inserted into either the ischiopubic foramen or the bone of the pubic body. Compression of the symphysis and fine adjustment to a dislocation in the cranial or posterior direction are possible. Bilateral type B lesion of the pelvic girdle. With this lesion, there is a malalignment of the external rotation of the right hemipelvis and a malalignment of the internal rotation of the left hemipelvis. There is also a flexion malalignment of the left hemipelvis. The reduction is accomplished by internal rotation of the right and external rotation of the left hemipelvis. This results in the correct derotation of the sacrum. In practice, force is applied in the posterior direction on the right side of the symphysial region, and on the left side, force is applied in the anterior direction. We recommend buttressing the pubic body posteriorly with a reconstruction plate on the side to which the traction force is applied. In this way, the screw securing the reduction forceps is prevented from being pulled out. On the right side, we push in the posterior direction. On the left, we pull in the ventral direction, which causes derotation of the sacrum and subsequently results in the correct alignment of the two hemipelvis. This method was described by Joel Mata. The use of the pelvic reduction forceps allows reduction maneuvers involving flexion, extension, and external and internal rotation of the hemipelvis. Transverse fracture of the left acetabulum. This is a juxtaposal transverse fracture of the left acetabulum viewed at an angle from the posterior direction. The distal main fragment is dislocated by either abduction, adduction, or external internal rotation. A shunt screw is inserted, oblique in two planes, into the body of the ischium and will serve as a reduction joystick. The reduction may also be achieved with a pelvic reduction forceps secured to the bone with 4.5 mm screws close to the greater ischiatic foramen. Distraction or compression of the fracture is possible, as is external internal rotation. 
Combined maneuvers consisting of distraction, derotation, and abduction are often required for the exact alignment of the main fragments. High fracture of the anterior column of the right acetabulum. Dislocation in the region of the iliac crest with the main fragments piled on top of each other, like roof tiles. The tip of the retractor is moved along the inside of the ilium and guided through the fracture to the lateral side of the ventral fragment. By turning the retractor 180 degrees, the stable fragment on the posterior side is reached. The retractor is then tilted in the ventral direction. The convexity of the retractor pushes the ventral fragment into the correct position. The reduction maneuver can also be performed directly on the iliac crest with the pointed reduction forceps. For better stability of the reduction forceps, two convergent oblique holes are drilled into which the tips of the forceps can be inserted. The same procedure can be performed with the pelvic reduction forceps and two 3.5 mm screws. The screw heads are grasped with the forceps and the reduction is created by compressing the fragments and moving them from side to side. Exercise 1. Reduction of a comminuted fracture of the ulna. In a complex forearm fracture, the mandatory anatomical reduction may be difficult without risk to vascularity. Distraction is achieved by fixing on the proximal fragment an LC-DCP of pre-planned length, 12 holes in this instance, and placing a screw in the distal ulna about a centimeter beyond the plate. The surgeon uses a spreader to produce distraction and indirect reduction of the fragments under the plate, which now bridges the fracture. A standard forearm approach will be needed. Risk to the vascularity of the fragments is diminished because none of the fragments is handled directly. Of course, the radius must also be fixed. Exercise 2. Reduction of a fracture of the distal femur. A comminuted distal femur fracture may be reduced with an angled blade plate. In such a case, one only needs to correctly place the seating chisel in the reduced articular fragment. A 95-degree angled blade plate can be used as a tool for reduction, as well as to give optimal mechanical fixation. The plate is then fixed in the proximal fragment by the bone-holding forceps. The articulated tension device is then placed in distraction mode and the articular fragment is distracted to allow reduction of the medial butterfly fragment. Following the reduction of the medial butterfly, the articulated tensioner is placed in a compression mode. With the butterfly held with a large pointed reduction forceps, the plate is tensioned. Rotation is controlled with a large standard reduction forceps. Tension is applied to the plate. <laughs>